Dedicated to the strength of the nation. Proudly, we hail. Yes, proudly we hail, starring Robert Ryan in That Men May Live, the United States Army and United States Air Force presentation. And now here is our producer, the well-known Hollywood showman, C.P. McGregor. Thank you, thank you, and greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your Theater of Stars, where Hollywood's finest motion picture talent joins us in plays we know you'll enjoy. Our star is Robert Ryan, in the title of our dramatic story, That Men May Live. We'll have the curtain for Act One of our play in just a moment. But first, here is our announcer, Wendell Niles, with this message of importance. Only the best can be aviation cadets. And now because your United States Air Force is planning for the future and wants the best young men, special consideration is being given to this year's college graduates who want careers as leaders in aviation. As officers in your United States Air Force, if you're graduating this June, apply now for aviation cadet training. As a college graduate, your application will be rushed so that you can begin training as soon as you graduate. Visit your U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force recruiting station today to make certain you're accepted for one of this summer's aviation cadet classes. Remember, only the best can be aviation cadets. And now once again, our producer. The curtain rises on Act One of That Men May Live, starring Robert Ryan as Dr. Joseph E. Smodell. The world owes much to that ever-vigilant group of mankind's benefactors, the doctors and scientists who are continually working with intellect and heart for the goal of driving disease from the face of the earth. Just a few short weeks ago, it was announced that a new wonder drug, chloramycetin, is now available commercially. This may or may not mean something to you, but to those millions who have ever been, or who may be in the future, prey to any of the dread typhus diseases, chloramycetin means the world of difference, possibly the difference between life and death. The development of chloromycetin is indeed remarkable, for it was barely two years ago that the drug was discovered, a mere formula, the potentialities of which were yet to be proved, but proved they were by five army doctors, headed by Dr. Joseph E. Smodell, head of the Department of Virus and Ricochet Diseases at the Army Medical Department Research and Graduate School. Dr. Spadell's story starts in March of last year. A majestic C-54 is winging its way across the Pacific. Destination, Malaya. Spadell, holding a picture of a small group in his hand, is speaking. Look, gentlemen, would you do me a favor? Uh, you mean, Joe, you want one of us to jump overboard to lighten the load, huh? <laughs> Well, I nominate Trump. I second that. Hey, wait a minute, I was only kidding. Relax, Bob, relax. I only meant I want you all to sign this picture of the five of us I had taken at Pearl. Say, I'm handsome. You're looking at me. All right, all right. All I want is your names on the picture. How about Colonel Phillips? Ah, don't bother him. He's buried in the book. We'll get him out of that book. Come on, Herb, put your John Henry here. Okay. Herbert L.A. Jr., First Lieutenant, Medical Corps, U.S. Army. Okay, now it's my turn. Ah, just a minute, young man. Seniority, you know. <laughs> Dr. Theodore E. Woodward. University of Maryland, School of Medicine. Lieutenant Colonel, Medical Corps, U.S. Army Reserve. All right, Bob, now you. Well, I'm not sure that I want to. However, I'll, I'll condescend. <laughs> Robert Traub, Major, Medical Service Corps, United States Army. And the finest signature I've never seen. Who hasn't signed? Philip. Colonel Philip. No, uh, he didn't hear you. He's too interested in this book. Huh? What? Oh, forgive me, gentlemen. I was quite engrossed in this uh, scholarly clinical report on behavioristic tendencies. Colonel, would you mind signing this picture? Oh, not at all, not at all. Up him. Well, thank you. Colonel Cornelius B. Philip, Army Medical Service Corps, on leave from the U.S. Public Health Service. There. Hey, fellas, look at this clinical report. 
The colonel was reading the Kinsey Report. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'll go up and talk with the pilot. Are you going to experiment on scrub typhus, doctor? That's one of them we're going after. Scrub typhus is mean stuff. Yeah, it sure is. Scrub typhus kills 15 out of every 100 who contract it. I don't want any of that. These tests you're going to make, uh, will you make them at Singapore? No, at Kuala Lumpur, a few hundred miles away. We'll be working out of the Institute of Medical Research, run by the British, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, what are you going to do with all those crates you've got loaded on the plane? That's our laboratory equipment. And the two Jeeps? Transportation out into the field. But tell me one thing, Doc. What's in that little package you're taking such particular care of? Looks like it weighs about a pound. That's the most vital part of this expedition. That little one-pound package contains the entire world's supply of what's going to do the job for us, we hope. Chloramycete. Well, we made Singapore all right. The director of the Institute of Medical Research, Dr. Raymond Luthwaite, was waiting for us. Dr. Luthwaite, who had done outstanding work in typhus research, accompanied us to Kuala Lumpur, site of the Institute. It was there we were permitted to set up our laboratory. A few days after our arrival, Dr. Luthwaite stopped by. Hello there. Anybody home? Yes, yes, indeed. Come right in, doctor. Well, I hope I'm not interrupting anything, Dr. Smadell. I was just wondering how you're getting on. Well, it's very kind of you to drop by. We're gradually getting everything in place. So I see. Oh, we're putting up a picture. Yes, the five of us. I had this taken at Pearl. The boys all signed it. Yes, I see. I see they've done even more. Some artwork, it looks like. <laughs> yes, Trob started that. He got a pencil and drew sideburns on Woodward. Woody thought it was lay, so he proceeded to put a goatee and pince nez on lay. There's no telling where it'll end. Liable to be a very priceless item before you're through. Well, uh, a few laughs anyway. I want to tell you how good it is to be here, Doctor, and to be permitted to work at the Institute. On the contrary, it is we who will be grateful to have your help. After all, you Americans discovered the drug, and you are conducting the tests. Well, you're very kind, Doctor. <laughs> Dr. Luth? Yes? Oh, dear God. Dear God, here you are. Well, what is it, my oh, dear? Oh, Doctor, Doctor, you must do something. My husband, he's dying, Scrub Typhus. He's dying. I know, I've seen it before. There, now, calm oh, yourself. We will send out a doctor. The doctor's been there all afternoon, but he says, oh, I, I just know my husband is dying. You must. Do something. The doctor is doing the best he can. <laughs> Excuse me, doctor. If we're not too late, there's still our new drug. Why, of course. We haven't even had a chance to unpack all our equipment yet, but with your permission, I'll get Dr. Woodward and go right now. Well, what do you think, Woody? Did we get here in time? I don't know, Joe. He's the sickest man with scrub typhus I've ever seen. If we could have arrived sooner, I know we could have pulled him through, but now it's... Yeah, it's just a... We've given him the full dosage, four grams of chloramycetin. If he lives another 24 hours, he'll be all right. Tired, Woody? I am. How's our patient? Can't tell right now. He should, uh... Hey, Joe, look. Get his wife, Woody. Right, right you up. Yeah, please, come right. What is it, Doctor? We'll know in a minute. Uh... Hello, honey. Oh, yes. Yes. Hey, I'm hungry. Oh. How about something to eat? Oh, thank God. Well, little lady, you heard the man. There's nothing wrong with your husband now that a good meal won't help. Come on, Woody. Our first victory, but it was only the beginning. Before we got started on our field tests... We had to be absolutely certain that chloramycetin had eliminated the possibility of fatalities in scrub typhus infection. After treating successfully a large number of patients, we decided it was time for the field tests. Well, Joe, now that we're all together, where do we go from here? Good question, Woody. First of all, for our field tests, we need volunteers. I volunteer. Me too. I'd oh, like to. Quiet, quiet. No, we'll have to look at this objectively. We can't take the chance of all being sick at once. Woodward and Lay will remain behind to take care of the ward and laboratory work. They will remain out of the tests. The rest of us will expose ourselves to the disease along with the other volunteers. Well, that makes only three volunteers. We'll need about 40 more. Where do they come from? That's our number one problem. Well, how about soldiers from the British regiment? They've already volunteered their services to help I'm us. I'm afraid not. I 
doubt that the war office in London would permit it. Say, the local prison. Prisoners are always willing to volunteer for scientific experiments. Uh, speaking from experience, Woody. Yeah, well, all quiet, youngster. Now, that's out, too. I don't believe regulations will allow it. Now what? Come in. Hello, Doc. My name's John Graydon. I'm one of the uh, warders of the local prison. Good, good, good. Take Traub there. I've always had a repressed desire to see him behind bars. Pipe down. What's the trouble, Graydon? I heard you want some men to tangle with them scrub typhus bugs, and I want a volunteer. Why, yes, we do need volunteers, but you realize you're apt to become very sick during the tests. Doc, I've fought Japs, I've lived, if you want to call it living, for years in a Jap prison camp. I've had ships blown up under me. No little measly typhus bugs going to scare me, and besides... Besides what? Well, Doc... I'm a man, though, uneducated himself, as he's highly respectful indeed of a man what is. And I'd consider myself honored indeed to be associated with such intellectual gentlemen as yourselves on a project as means the life of many. All right, fella. We're, uh, we're proud to have you. Well, that's one more, but we're still far short of 40 volunteers. What's troubling you, if I might ask, sir? You see, we need quite a few to volunteer for these tests. Uh, begging your pardon, sir, but that's simple enough. If it was me, I'd just go down in the center of the city, I'd stand on a street corner and I'd yell, all you blokes who want to take part in some medical experiments, follow me. <laughs> You'd have more than you could handle. Wait a minute. That idea agrees with something Dr. Luthwaite was saying. A want ad. We'll put a volunteer's wanted ad in the Straits Times and the Daily Mail. Excellent idea. Well, Joe, is there anything else or can we adjourn this little meeting? There is something else. Something very important. Yes? What's that? Who drew those handlebar mustaches on my picture? Well, what do you mean? Wasn't it? Rob? Why, I wouldn't dream of drawing those handlebars. <laughs> but you'll have to admit they do something for you. I can't understand it, Herb. It's past time for them to report an answer to the ad, and not a soul has appeared. Guess it sounded too dangerous. I suppose so. I'll get it. Hello? Miss Madell? This is Lethwaite. For goodness sake, take this mob off my hands. What mob? In answer to your ad, they came to the administration building at the Institute instead of your laboratory. There must be hundreds of them. Wonderful. Send them over here. At last, we can start our field tests immediately. We pause briefly from our story, That Men May Live, starring Robert Ryan, to bring you an important message from our government. Ladies and gentlemen, our Army and our Air Force are critically short of physicians and dentists. Over 2,000 volunteers from these two professions are urgently needed today to safeguard and care for the health of the men and women, whereas members of the United States Army and United States Air Force are serving you and me at home and overseas. Young physicians and dentists, particularly those who did not serve in the armed services during World War II, have been asked by their government to act now to volunteer for duty at once. If you are one of these young physicians or dentists, please write or wire either the Surgeon General of the United States Army or the Air Surgeon of the United States Air Force at once and volunteer your services. If you know one of these young physicians or dentists, please call his attention to this urgent message. Thank you. The curtain rises on Act Two of That Men May Live, starring Robert Ryan as Dr. Joseph Smadell. Things are progressing at the laboratories of Kuala Lumpur, where the mysteries of the new wonder drug, chloromycetin, are being unraveled. Even the group photograph on the wall bears a new assortment of penciled-in goatees and mustaches, sure to get a smile from those who see it. In their research, Dr. Smadell and his group of Army Medical Department scientists have cleared all preliminary obstacles and are ready for the field tests. These tests were designed to provide us with information on whether the new drug was effective in preventing scrub typhus as well as curing it. Our volunteers were of many races and nationalities. British planters, Malay workers, Burmese, Javanese, Indians, British scientists from the British Scrub Typhus Unit, which was also working at the Institute, members of the Institute staff, and of course, the Americans from our group. Names like John Graydon, Hashim Bin Yatim, Juan Unid, and Patrick Drew Wilkinson. 
The first day of our tests, just before going out in the field, we held a last-minute briefing. All right, men, here's the pitch. Philip and Traub have been studying in the fields near here for several weeks. They've located three or four lalang fields where the scrub typhus mite seems to be especially abundant. Lalang? Native grass. Oh, I still say the scrub typhus mite doesn't prefer lalang exclusively. Well, granted, Bob, but in this area it seems to be most prolific in lalang grass. Well, we'll all go out and spend a day in the field. Yeah, how about returning for a couple of hours at noon? It's too blasted hot then, even for a scrub typhus mite. We may do that later in the test, but at present we must spend as much time as possible in the infected area. The pills are ready, Joe. Good. Half of the volunteers will take one gram of chloramycetin each day. The other half of them will not. In this way, we can compare the preventive effect of the drug. Hey, look at Graydon out there. He's really taking this research seriously. He's got those men lined up and toeing the mark. They all have a healthy respect for the warder. <laughs> <laughs> Everything set then, Joe? Everything except one thing. Who walked off with that group picture of mine? The picture's gone? Now, don't act coy. Oh, oh, now, what you... now, listen, I want that picture. When we get through with these tests, I better find that picture right back in the wall where it belongs or else... Let's go. Out into the steaming fields we went, through the high law line we coursed, stripped to the waist, inviting the might with which the field was supposed to abound, inviting the disease that killed 15 out of every 100 who contracted it, and hospitalized for weeks those who didn't die. For 12 days, we went out early and spent the day beneath the glaring, almost unbearably hot sun and returned late at night. On the 12th day, we remained back at the hospital, awaiting the first of the volunteers to come down with the deadly scrub typhus. Nothing happened. On the 13th day, with still no results, Philip was talking to me. Oh, I don't know, Joe. First result should have showed up yesterday. Give them time, Phil. You know it takes 12 days for the disease to incubate. And probably nobody was infected the first day out in the field. I suppose I'm just too impatient. We'll just have to wait. Excuse me, Doc. Hello, Graydon. What can I do for our most interested and fearless volunteer? Well, it's kind of you to say it, Doc. It's I who am honored, but blimey, Doc, I don't feel well at all. This may be it, Joe. This morning I had a chill, see? Now I feel hot all over. Let me see. Huh. Fever. Uh-huh. Mm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Graydon, you want to know something? Yes, Doc. You're not only the first volunteer, you're the first to get scrubbed typhus. By me, it's, it's what me honored and hoped for. I'm twice honored. Hey, hey, hey. Graydon, Great. he's fainted. Let's get him over to the ward and some chloramycetin. Scrub typhus has struck our first unprotected volunteer, and we can't let anything happen to this fellow. <laughs> Dr. Woodward and I dropped by to see how you're feeling. Blimey, sir, I feel I could wrestle an alligator. And, sir, it was most generous of you to give me this pair of laboratory forceps. Well, you're one of us, Graydon. I'm awfully glad you're feeling better. I'm merely anxious, sir, to be up and about so as I can be of further assistance to you, gentlemen. Uh, well, we're going to keep you here for a few more days so that you can rest up. Provided you don't try to chase your nurse down the hall. Don't you worry about that, Doc. Me nurse's name is William. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we won't have to worry. We'll see you in a few days, Graydon. Come on, Woody. Uh, all right. Well, Graydon made a quick comeback, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Thanks to Chloramycetin. With an assistance from those laboratory forceps you gave him. Oh, he's so proud of them. Well, Woody, we've had phenomenal luck so far with scrub typhus. We certainly have. Will we have the same luck with typhoid? <laughs> Any prediction in regard to that killer at this point would be sheer insanity. Let's get scrub typhus worked out. If we're victorious on that alone, I'll be satisfied. Oh, incidentally, a couple of more of the volunteers were brought in today. Looks like the mite is going to work in earnest. Yes, the mite was going to work in earnest. The 12 days we spent in the disease-infested La Lang was beginning to tell. Each day, a few more of the volunteers came down with scrub typhus. But the drug maintained its miraculous record. In every case, the fever was broken and the men well on the way to recovery in from 24 to 30 hours. That is, every case until... One day at the hospital, Woody ran up. Oh, Sir Joe. Oh, here you are. What's the matter, Woody? I, uh, I think we've hit a snag. A snag? What do you mean? 
But it's not serious yet. All the men who have come down with typhus are responding magnificently, except two. Now, these two aren't making the progress they should. How are the two men now? Well, we gave them the full dosage, but there's been very little change. They're in their second day. Good heavens, man. We better get over to the ward right away. Here are the men, Joe, and here are their charts. Uh-huh. Hmm. Second day, no improvement. Have you made the tests, Herb? All of them. Blood test everything. Joe, I'm afraid these men are moving into a critical stage. I can't understand it. The fever should have broken by now. Maybe we've been overconfident. No, but we've had such wonderful results up to now. At any rate, a day or two and we'll know. Woody, it's the end of the third day. Something's got to happen or we can throw out everything we've done so far. Uh, here's the thermometer. I've got a reading on this man's temperature. Look, Woody. It is down. What? The fever's breaking. Good. Thank heaven, Woody. Thank heaven. Well, Woody, those two men are getting along fine. <laughs> Surely had me worried for a while. You think I wasn't? You know, Joe, there's something not quite right about this. These men seem to have typhus, and yet... Yeah, I know, I know, and we're still not out of the woods. There's one thing we have to do right now. Lab tests? Right. We've got to find out if it was really typhus these men had. If it was, we have to find out why they didn't respond to treatment like all the rest. If it wasn't typhus, we'll have to know what it was. Well, Joe, here are the results of our analysis. Uh-huh. I see. And it looks to are me... Are you thinking the same thing I am? No doubt at all. I've shown Dr. Luthwaite our findings. I've talked it over with Woody. And there's no doubt about it. It wasn't typhus that caused the men to respond more slowly than usual? No, Herb. These men picked up their illness down at that restaurant on Mountbatten Road. You mean they had typhoid fever? Right. Chalk up another victory for chloromycetin. A victory over one of the blackest killers of them all, typhoid. Men, the first and most important phase of our test is completed. You've all done wonderful work. That goes for you too, Joe. You oh. bet it does, Joe. <laughs> Thanks, fellas. We've worked as a team, and only as a team would we accomplish what we've set out to do. Before woodshedding our results, however... I still would like to know who made off with my picture. Oh, oh, no. 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 Excuse me, excuse oh. me, Dr. Smedell. Well, Graydon. I'm begging your pardon for bringing in like this, sir, but I found something of yours. Here. Well, my missing picture. What? Oh. Where did you find this, Graydon? By the strangest sort of coincidence, I happened to find it in my own possession. Oh, he had You, a... you... You took this picture, Graydon? Oh, sir, I was tempted beyond my own powers to have something of my own, bearing the likeness of you gentlemen. Well, I see you've uh, erased our artwork. <laughs> oh, blimey, sir, tis blasphemous to contort the faces of such gentlemen as is gentlemen of intellect. Uh -huh. Quiet, Trump, quiet. <laughs> well, gentlemen, what do you say? Don't you think the picture means more to him than it does to us? Ah, sir, sure. like give it to <laughs> All right, Graydon, it's yours. Oh, thank you, sir. It's the happiest moment of my life. <laughs> I'll always remember what you said to me that day in the hospital. Graydon, you said, you're one of us. Well, morning, gentlemen. Goodbye, Graydon. Hello, Graydon. <laughs> well, now that mystery is cleared up. Back to our report on chloromycetin. First, I think we've proved without doubt that chloromycetin is an effective cure against scrub typhus, typhoid fever, allied diseases such as spotted fever, and probably others which haven't been proved as yet. In my report to the Army Medical Department, I am going to recommend that the large-scale production of chloromycetin be started immediately. The first commercial form should be available for general public use in the spring of 1949. Gentlemen, another successful chapter in the conquest of disease has been written. <sighs> and now, what about us? Why, we're just getting started here. We've got work to do. The curtain falls on the final act of That Men May Live. Our star, Robert Ryan, will return for a curtain call after this important message from Wendell Niles. This is important. This is urgent. Over 2,000 young physicians and dentists are needed as volunteers at once for service in the United States Army or United States Air Force. These physicians and dentists are required to safeguard the health 
of the men and women who are serving our country in the armed services. If you are a physician or a dentist, you are needed now. Write or wire the Surgeon General of the United States Army or the Air Surgeon of the United States Air Force at once, volunteering for active duty. Let me repeat that. Write or wire the Surgeon General of the United States Army or the Air Surgeon of the United States Air Force today. Or see your local U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force recruiting station. And now, once again, our star, Robert Ryan, and our producer. Well, Bob, things have changed since you were here with us the last time. That was during the war, and then you went off to join the Marines. That's right, C.P., but instead of fighting enemy soldiers, the Army is fighting diseases. Like typhus. Yes, the medical men are a big need in the Army today. The work must go on like the last line of our play, remember? Oh, you mean, uh, while we're just getting started here, we've got work to do. That's it, and how true it is. I've just had word from Washington that right at this very moment, those five scientists are continuing their research in Malaya. Yes, and when they finish that, they'll go on to another, and another. This business of saving lives from disease never ends. Fortunately for us. But, Bob, there's another story I want to talk to you about. Oh? Yes, sir, your new RKO picture with Audrey Totter, the setup. What's it all about? Well, it's, it's strictly a fight picture. A third-rate fighter in a fourth-rate club. It's about the fight game as it really is. No glamour, no gangsters, no great love. I'll be sure to catch it. I'll bet you didn't think that someday in pictures you'd be calling on your boxing experience when you were an intercollegiate heavyweight champion at Dartmouth, did you? No, I didn't. But I did hope to get on the stage and then into pictures. As a comedian. How are you doing? Doing everything else except. Lots of serious characters, but no comedy. All right, now that I know that, when we have a comedy here, I'll give you a ring and we'll start the ball rolling right here. Well, that's a bet, C.P. And now I'd better be getting along to little Cheney's birthday party. And thanks for that birthday cake for him. That should feed all the kids in the valley. <laughs> well, it'll keep them busy for a while. I'll guarantee you that much. Well, it was very thoughtful, and Jessica and I both appreciate it, C.P. Now tell me, what's coming up here with you next week before I leave? Next week, Bob, and ladies and gentlemen, we are offering a specially written play to commemorate the seventh anniversary of the Women's Army Corps. And starring will be the beautiful and talented actress, Mary Astor. I'm sure every one of you will enjoy this special program, and I know you'll all want to listen. Well, that sounds like a good one, and we'll all be listening. Thanks again, and so long, C.P. Goodbye, Bob. And be sure to listen next week, ladies and gentlemen, when we bring you Mary Astor in a special program honoring the seventh anniversary of the Women's Army Corps. Until then, thanks for listening, and cheerio from Hollywood. courtesy of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee, which arranges for the appearance of all stars on this program. The script was by W. James Bastian, with music under the direction of Eddie Dunstetter. This program is transcribed in Hollywood for release at this time. Wendell Niles speaking.